when you got your first leadership gig, loving the new role, but feeling the pressure of your new responsibilities and all that expectation to perform, well, don't worry, you're not alone. Crossing the chasm from a technical role to leadership, from doing stuff to managing and leading people is the toughest challenge any leader must make. Welcome to the Human Edge Show, the podcast dedicated to help you do just that, successfully cross the doing to leading chasm. Campbell Such here, Chief Chasm Crossing Guide. I've made all the mistakes so you don't have to. I want to help you learn those lessons much more easily by sharing my experiences and talking with brilliant people who have already figured it out. You'll get great actionable tips, strategies and techniques to make the transition so much easier and faster for you. Now let's get to it. Well, welcome to the Human Edge Show. I'm super excited to have Vaughan Robertson from Becker's on the show with me. Welcome, Vaughan. Great to have you here. Thanks, Campbell. Appreciate it, mate. Uh, to start off, I'm, I'm going to just read Vaughan's bio to make sure that I, uh, that I get it right. So we'll just, we'll just kick into that. So Vaughan Robertson is Group Manager, Technology Strategy for Becker. In his role as Technology Fellow in Emerging Technologies and as designated futurist for Becker, he researches and monitors the digital environment, analyzing the potential impact on Becker and Becker's clients and assessing appropriate timing for investment in new technologies. These areas encompass a wide array of disruptive technologies, and this is a real theme for Vaughan, including artificial intelligence, augmented reality, drones, UAV, brain computer interfaces, the internet of things, blockchain and quantum computing amongst many others. And perhaps we'll be touching on some of those through this. So uh, welcome Vaughan. How about you. telling us something, uh, something that not many people would know about you? Well, it's a bit, bit, bit hard. Um, I guess I, I thought of something that is, I'm not, I'm not sure if nobody knows about it, but um, it was had a real impact on me. Last two weeks of my first year at university, I was uh, coming home from work in a burger bar in the middle of the night and I got hit by a car and lost the lower half of my leg. Four months in hospital, traction beds, <clears throat> months and months of rehab, wheelchairs, blah, blah, blah. Um, and of course, it was a life-changing experience. But whilst it sounds like it's a terrible life-changing experience, um, I think probably on balance, it was probably a good thing for me because it taught me just how valuable life is and how the unforgiving minute can be used and just what appreciation you can get out of out of living. So um, I think, as I say, on balance, I wouldn't recommend it as a way of learning stuff, but it was a pretty, um, yeah. uh, it was an epiphany for me. And, and as I say, probably on balance, a, a positive impact. Yeah, there well, you go. That, that's, <laughs> that's all. Well, it's not awesome that it happened, but that's, that's amazing. And uh, Oh, and it helped me get a job to... as a pirate once. <laughs> <laughs> you got a parrot that sits on your it sits yeah, on your yeah. <laughs> <Eye patch. laughs> isn't there a there's a, isn't there a talk like a pirate day that we have a global talk like a pirate day i don't know if you relate to that but uh, i think there is one it's a, <laughs> army <armies. laughs> classic <sighs> so it's so as a as a, as a kind of a, a a platform for you to grow and and develop your life and then into your into your commercial and and uh and leadership life can you just talk a little bit about the first steps that you made into leadership and what you perhaps understood it might be like and what it actually turned out to be like? Sure. Um, first of all, I was trying to, there, there's no one point where you, where I got into a leadership role that I can think of immediately. I early on, and I mean early on secondary school, university and so on, I took on roles that had responsibility. For example, um, at university, I was on the student staff committee. Now, that was sort of a, a consultative thing with the faculty heads and so on. And I took on, so, so it was basically representing the students. Now, it's not leadership per se, and it wasn't a voted position. It was, well, I can't remember. I think it was appointed by the dean from memory. So, so and when I was in a university hostel, I was the, the hostel president. Um, and so it, I don't know whether that's sort of formal leadership or representation, um, but through the years, representing people and working for people was probably the, the, the key element that's common to all, all of it. I think to be a leader, 
you have to like people. And that's probably a that's probably a biggie. And I am addicted to people. So I think that was that was one of the things I thought uh, when you talked about what is it that you need for leadership is that you need to genuinely respect people. Um, it's very hard to lead people. I find some people may do it better. I find it's very hard to lead people that I don't respect. I can I can lead people who I don't like, but I find it a lot harder to lead people who I don't respect. Right. Yeah. 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 It's interesting too, and I think that if you flip that one around too, from a um, from a leadership perspective, one of the things that that I've found, while I while it's great to be liked, the most important thing as a leader is to have your teams and the people around you respect you, and that may lead to to being liked, and and hopefully you have both. But actually, the most important thing is respect, right? And I guess I yep. haven't actually considered it going both ways, but of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, that's a that's a really good point because um, if, if we talked about the mistakes I've made, um, one of the things I tried. Well, no, one of the things I've had all the way through that possibly has been not the best way I could do it is worry about being liked by my team. And your your distinction between liked and respected there is really, really important because being mates with your team is good, but it has some dangers. Um, I, I have a work colleague who, who who is worse at this than I am in that she's a fantastic leader She's also a really hard case person and really nice to get on with, um, but her team doesn't know when it's the boss or the mate that's that's in the room, and and that's actually quite a, a difficult distinction to make. Um, take a step on from there. The way that you generate that respect, and maybe the way you get liked, but uh, that's not so important. But the way you generate that respect, something that I found. Uh, relatively late in, in life, and that is um, praise, appreciation. And, and it's really tricky because if you give praise to your staff all the time, it doesn't sound real. And it's not, and people pick it up. I mean, people um, uh, fawn over you. It, it, it doesn't have the, the appropriate impact. When you give somebody genuine, honest, heartfelt appreciation for what they do, God, I love the way that you deal with those people. You're so much nicer than I am. You know, when, it, when it's absolutely genuine, people pick up on it and, they, and that generates a wonderful working relationship. When you do it half-assed, when you do it because it's you're supposed to, when you do it and it's not absolutely genuine, it's really bad. So genuine appreciation often, and you can't do too much of it. Yeah. And, you can't and, do too much of it. And the key, and that, that genuineness is really important, isn't it? And, I, and one of the things that, I've, that I believe and that I think I've picked up from what you're saying too is it's the specificity or the specificness of that praise yeah. as well. It's yeah. not just a, hey, you're doing a great job. It's yeah. I really yeah. love the yeah. way that you're doing this yeah. particular thing or that That's you right. that person or, or whatever it was that you that they specifically did. You're so good at doing such and such. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Employee of the month doesn't cut it, I'm sorry. And the other one that came up quite recently to me is the whole concept of coaching. You know, and, and I'm a great teller of people. I love sharing things. I love I love um, debating stuff. I love opining about things. But asking questions uh, is, a, is a skill that you cannot overdevelop. Um, I, I know of people who can ask questions to get any answer that they want. And boy, that's clever. Yeah. And if you do that with people, they, they, you engage with them. Um, and so if there was a skill that I would love to, to be much, much better at, and I would uh, recommend that everybody practices, it's learning how to ask probing and open and closed and um, manipulative and um, information gathering questions and get it so that you can do it on a dime. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's, pow it's powerful to be able to ask questions. And, and interestingly, when, when you're asked questions, when you... What happens when someone tells you to do something? We, we tend to do this, even instinctively, even if we know it's, it's you know, we just don't like to be told. Whereas if you're involved through a process of questioning, even if it's Socratic, you know, a series of questions that leads you to a, to a result that the person is trying to get you to, it's a much 
more comfortable and, and much more likely that you'll buy into it. And, and especially in a leadership role, that's, that's super powerful. One of the, um, one of the big challenges with a lot of, uh, with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, telling is that um, it's great advice, but people like being, when they're told, they tend to resist it. Whereas with the, there's a, there's a term in the book I'm reading about um, coaching and, and questions called the advice monster. And, uh, and the, the key, Sorry? the advice monster um, the advice monster, which is yeah. the advice monster, right? So, which is which is not getting to, it, which is just holding off on on. And what he talks about is holding off on giving the advice until you've asked a couple more questions. So you've gone a little bit deeper and really getting a feel for what the true situation is, not just your first take on it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that's true. I also think to be um, uh, candid, I think boys are worse at this than girls. I think as as blokes, we leap. We don't leap to conclusions. We we leap to solutions. Yeah. So we say, "Here, I can help you with this." Blah blah blah. Here's the answer, as opposed to probing more and coming back to it. And this is very much do as I say, not what I do, because I'm I'm terrible at it. I really am. It's it's a uh, the number of times I go, "Ah, oh, I should have I should have checked in a bit more about that. I should have done that more." But having having said that. I think I've I've probably um, gone down a track where I need to just pull back a bit and say honesty and empathy um, with your team is a really, really critical thing. I probably should have said that as baseline and that you will get the best out of your team when, when you tell them what's going on. I get very frustrated when my leadership is not completely open with me. Now, there are times when they can't be, and there are times when I can't be with my staff, but I will always be absolutely as, give them as much information as possible about what's going on because people pick up on it when you don't, especially over a period. And you you can lose respect and you can, you can lose the trust of your team very easily when it's become clear that you're keeping things from them that you potentially didn't have to or indeed past the point that you needed to. So, so that honest, that honest thing and, and keeping them in the loop and, and um, explaining to them what's going on and giving them the the context for the things that are happening is really valuable. And I guess um, that probably leads to another sort of broad principle about what leadership is. And I think people have it around the wrong way. You know, they they draw a leadership triangle with the pointy end at the top and then like this. But I actually think it's absolutely the other way around, where where a leader sits there and underpins their people's efforts. And they talk about top cover. But what you're talking about is there's being an enabler and removing barriers and working out how you can make it easier for your people to do what it is that they do. Because... Uh, one of the very early lessons I got from a from a bloke in a software firm I worked for, um, he said, you know, I just realized, he said, me working at 120% productivity is still only a fraction of my team working at 80%. So as a, as a, a leader, um, if you can get your team working from eighty for eighty four from eighty five percent instead of eighty percent, um, the bang for bucks a hell of a lot better than than you doing more. And and there's a corollary of that, which is again a tough lesson, which is, I know how I would do this, and I think I would do it better than my staff member would do it. However, that's me doing it, so I'm going to put up with my staff member doing it the way that they want to do it, even if it's not as efficient or not as effective as what I think I could do, because then it's them them doing it, not me. And that's a good thing. And if I'm good enough to be able to coach and if I'm good enough to um, diplomatically give them guidance as to how to do it better, that's cool. But if I don't, that's not the end of the world. Doesn't it doesn't actually matter, and people can do things differently and not as well as what I might think I can do it, but it's still done. 
Yeah, and you haven't had to do it. And I haven't had to do it. And what's more, they've learned how to do it. They're, they're not monkeys, you know. They're not. They're, they're not just following along here. They're doing. They're learning themselves. So. Yeah. Easy yeah, to say. Powerful. And the other thing too is you, you may think you've got the best way to do it, but someone That's else right. may actually find a better way than you. And so you've missed out on that opportunity too if you tell them how to do it rather than working with yeah. them to get it. Because, you know, you set the, this is what yeah. needs to be done. That's right. Um, it's up to you to, to work out the best way to do it for you. That, that's right. And that's that's a that's a really good point too. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a sad indictment, uh, Campbell, but I've got old man's disease in that we used to, we, we used to do it this way. That's not how we did it in my day, or, or we've done that before and it didn't work. That's the cliche. Yeah. We did that before and it didn't work, especially with quite young people. You sit there and you go, yes, I, I see where this is going. They're going to do this and it's wrong and we've done it before and it doesn't work. And then if you actually sit down and shut up and let them do it, you come out and you find they, they make it work. So just because we did it in the 1970s and that's how it worked, um, doing it the different with different tools and with different ideas and with different enthusiasm and with different drive and so on, you can make it work. So so I've learned again, especially with young people, and goodness gracious, young smart people are just the wonderful, wonderful group to work with. Um, because so long as you don't stifle them so long as your guidance is with a light hand and with a enabling and with helping them and removing barriers, man, they do things that are amazing. It's wonderful. And again, I've, I've, I've learned this relatively recently and there is nothing more satisfying than taking a, a group of um, 20 something year olds and uh, helping them to do something together as a, as a team. Very, very satisfying. As a new leader in a new role, that one of the biggest challenges is for, for many is that we feel we have to have all the answers. Mm. Um, we've talked about questions, and I, I actually believe that it's far more important to have the questions because you, you can't you can't know it all. And, and we're just talking about you can't do it all yourself either. And, and it's the key is to have your team, you, you know, you're helping them to do what they need to do, taking the obstacles out of their path, setting the agenda, showing them the, where, where we need to go and, and then letting them work out the best way to get there. And that, then they'll own it and may even do it better than you. Um, but it's a real challenge as a new leader to, to feel that you can let kind of what was I'm not sure what the right word is but let go or be um, be comfortable in the uncertainty of having someone else do something that you know you could do better for them how yeah. do you have any advice that you'd give to a new leader in, in how they might go about getting to that point a bit earlier in their career rather than later in their career well I think I think you've got to do it otherwise you don't survive as a leader um and may, maybe just maybe I'll put the other side of the coin it's very frustrating when you develop a culture where your team comes to you to ask you what to do all the time and you can get in a situation and, and certain personalities will do this. When people come to you and say, I've got a problem, that's cool. I might, I have the experience and the knowledge and possibly to help solve that problem, but I must, must, must get in the habit of saying, so what's the answer? So you do not come to me with the problem, Sonny, unless you come to me with what you propose to do about it. And I will, because I have more experience potentially, because I might have more knowledge, I might know the strategic view or, or what the managing director says or what somebody, you know, I can have an opinion that might differ from yours, but I jolly well want you to come up with your best answer to start with. And if you don't, then I will say, well, go back and work out the answer and then come and we'll talk. And I think that, that as a, as a new leader, to instill the culture where people come to you with the proposed solution instead of just the problem is one of the things that will pay the biggest dividends in your working career. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, fully, fully agree with that. And I think the, and the other one, too, that's sort of correlated to that is around coming to you with uh, to make the decisions as well. So n not yeah. just solve a problem, but also the decisions. Well, if they should be making the decision as opposed to you, yeah. then they should make the decision and then you can support them through that process. And if it was a different decision yeah. to what you would have made, well, you can talk about that. But it yeah. isn't necessarily a wrong decision. Uh, so there's two things, right? One is yeah. coming to you with problems that they expect you to solve. And the other one is coming to, to you with decisions that they should be making. Unfortunately, yeah. a lot of leaders feel they have to make all the decisions. And yeah. 
they they absolutely have to make the decisions that they have to make, but not the ones that they shouldn't be making that their team should be making. And and it's a tough challenge to let go a bit of that as well and get other people to make those decisions. That that that's very true. And and you can there's a halfway house, and I use it all the time with my boss. Is that is I'll, I'll say. Well, I think we should do this. Are you okay with that? So I can I can ask for, for validation of a decision that I have made and I'm trying to get a, a percentage on it. It would be definitely less than 10%. I, I, I don't know if it would be five where my boss would say, uh, well, have you thought about or I don't think we should or Here, here's another alternative. 10% of the time, maybe, not very much. Very often it is, yeah, okay, that's cool, and we could do this as well. Or, you know, it, it, the, the decision will be enhanced by his input, but it won't be changed. Yeah. And so, so I, don't, I don't think it has to be, I'm going to make this decision come hell or high water, and uh, I'm not going to tell you. It's, here's, here's what I've decided does that sound okay to you? Vaughan, from, um, from the perspective of you, you've moved up through the, through the ranks in your career and you've been a leader of teams, uh, is, is there anything that you could talk about around leading leaders? One of the big challenges with a lot of, with a lot of uh, new leaders is that they throw in the deep end and expect it to s- swim. And, and many of them aren't suited, haven't been aren't necessarily suited. They've come from a technical role where those skills that they've got in their technical role aren't the same skills they need to be able to move into that next role. And a lot of them really struggle, feel stressed, overwhelmed, can't talk to their boss because they feel like that would be showing signs of, you know, um, lack of ability or weakness. Um, so as a, as a, a leader who's put a new leader from a technical role into a leadership role, is there anything you, you can kind of point to or think about or give yeah. some advice around what, what would help an, a leader who's put a new leader into a role support that leader to be successful crossing that chasm from doing to yeah. leading? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point because, as, as you say, we, we're typically we're awful. We're, we're, the decision to put somebody in a leadership role probably has process behind it. But the, well, after that, there doesn't seem to be a lot of process sometimes. It's a bit dangerous. What I would say just, just prior to putting somebody in a leadership role, and it's a cliche, but it's worthwhile considering, is that the best performers are not necessarily the best leaders. And the EQ that goes into dealing with people is different to the IQ that goes with the technical role. Um or indeed the personality that goes with the business development role and relationships that are cross are not necessarily the same as, as the relationship you develop with leading people. Having said that, and assuming you've got somebody in a leadership position, um, the very first and most obvious thing, which is the biggest mistake, is time. You've got to still, just because you've got somebody in that leadership role, that does not abrogate your responsibility to spend the time with that leader. And everybody does it. Oh, oh. Bill's doing that now. Julie's, Julie's got the team now. We're all good. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I'll go and do my stuff. Whoa, great. Ah, and that's, that's the killer because then Julie's sitting there going, what happened? What am I doing? And then Julie comes to you and says, I want, and you go, yeah, yeah, okay, hang on. Well, well, let's do it in our weekly catch-up. Yeah. Time, spending the time with them is a, a, a huge one. Checking in with them regularly. Now, people do formal check-ins, and that's pretty good, but that's useful alongside the cup of coffee and how's it going. That's useful. And then there's the other one. There's the corridor conversation. There's the make enough time so that you can stop by their desk or Zoom them and say, oh, I just had 10 minutes, wanted to check out how's it going. 
the, the five minute check in, the, the, the corridor conversation. It doesn't have to be a half hour cup of coffee or an hour long sit down in a meeting room with an agenda. Just literally the, the snippets of, of how's it going. It's really, really huge for that leader. And obviously, being a sounding board's helpful, but um, the, the relationship to show them that you're still supporting them and their team is big. Uh, when when you don't know your direct reports, you, that should be a flag. You should you should have a, a relationship with the direct reports of your direct reports, regardless of uh, of the two steps in it in terms of the hierarchy. And those relationships should not detract from your leader being able to lead. So it's not cutting across your your leader. It's actually working with them in terms of how their people work. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really powerful. And that relationship, just to clarify a little bit about the direct reports, direct reports, the relationship that, that you'd look to build with as a leader of leaders with their direct reports is around just making sure that you know them, know what's going on. It's not yeah. a, it's not trying to second guess or, or cut yeah. out the, the leader. It's really to help support them by... by yeah being able to better see the situation, possibly bring things to them that they might not otherwise be able to see themselves with your experience and that, that kind of thing. That's right. And, and that leads to a, a very good point is when you've gone from a situation where you've stepped up and somebody else has stepped into your role, you've got to be really sensitive there to be clear about what you do not do with your old team. So, 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 you know, there's a, a cliche when the um, managing director becomes the chairman, you know, of that's not what I'd do. And the, the, so the chairman's still doing the managing director's job, even when they're, even when they're out of it, you know, so when you get out of a role, you've got to be very conscious that it's not. I remember um, I was a section manager, department manager in our parlance and Four or five years later, I've, I've moved on to do a whole lot of different things. And there was this new bloke in, in this um, same section. And the first time I met him, I had a conversation with him. And he said something to the effect that, I wish this team was more homogenous. They all think that they're special. And I thought, actually, they are special. <laughs> and actually, they are all definitely not homogenous and they shouldn't be. And the job as the leader of these people is to get the best out of each one of them. And I'm sitting there going, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. And I, the guy didn't last very long, I have to say. But I thought from that comment, I knew that he was not the right leader for this particular team. Yeah, that's, 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 that's really a powerful insight, right? I mean, you look at, if you take a, a sports team, right? the All Blacks, for example, each one of those players is a special player in yeah. a, that's highly yeah. uh, focused on and has special skills in their role. And they've built a team around all of those things. And the, the best halfback's never going to be the best line out jumper. So yeah. why try and make them homogenous and expect it to be like that? You, you never right. get an ultimate performance out of that. That's right. And it goes back to that thing we started very much at the start of our conversation about diversity and the best teams come with different skills that they're all bringing in with mutual respect with the ability to say, well, look, hang on, that's a number crunching problem. Now I can do that, but Stephen's so much better at that. Um, oh, we've got a visioning thing. Well, look, I'm good with the mechanics of these things, but if I want somebody to make a creative leap, um, uh, Barbara was much better at that than what I am. Barbara, what would you do with this situation? Yeah. Da, da, da. That, that, that where you're u- utilizing the div- diverse skills, it's not just effective. It's also extremely satisfying because it gets stuff done in a way that is beautiful. You know, the, the outcomes that you get out of working with a team like that, where you're watching everybody performing well in their own spheres, coming together to the whole solution. I, I can remember uh, uh, a conversation. I can't even remember what the subject. Oh, yes. I, yeah, it, was a, it was a process discussion. And I had six people in the room. I, I was theoretically their boss but there's six people in the room and they're <laughs> scary smart. And the noise level was dramatic. I mean, there was a, an Irish woman who is one of the cleverest brains I think I've ever worked with. Um, 
and she's talked about 47,000 words per minute. Uh, and the noise level in this room and the, the, the discussion, it wasn't a discussion, it sounded like a melee, you know, but the, the solution we came up with and the power of the solution we came up with and the, the, um, the speed with which it worked was just mind-blowing. And it was because of that whole uh, sharing ideas. No, no, that's a dumb idea. I know you're not supposed to say that, are you? You're supposed to say, oh, let's, no, this group will say, that's a dumb idea. I'll tell you why, because you should do this, this, this. And the, the respect was such that that was absolutely fine because it wasn't your dumb. It was, that's a dumb idea. And I know, I, I, I don't believe the books say that that's the appropriate way to do it, but my goodness gracious, when you get a team that can work that way constructively, oh, you can get something done. And I remember coming out of that room, walking three feet above the ground, just from the energy that had come out from this synergistic discussion. Fantastic stuff. And looking back, looking back on that, that conversation, what do you think you brought to that team that help them get to that point of respect, obviously trust. There was a feeling of real safety within the team that meant they could say those things without without feeling like they were out of line or that the other person would take it the wrong way and, and that ultimately led to that. I, th- I think it's the, the, the nature of the personalities to start with goes with it. And actually I'll come to another point on that too, surely. I think, that may, I think um, time working together makes a difference uh, there, there is no doubt in work as in sport as in everything practice helps so the more time you have with your team doing stuff together the better they get at it if they're the right people um, I think enthusiasm and as a leader having enthusiasm is good I, I, that is one of my one of my um, chosen habits is to be passionate about things and there's, there are times when actually being pat, we talked about it before about, you know, bring the times when you don't bring emotion into stuff. But generally speaking, I really, a passion, what does they say? Um, passion eats strategy for lunch. Is that the one? Oh, is that right? Yeah, or it might be culture eats strategy for lunch. But the principle that still remains to me is, is if you're passionate about things, you get things done. And if you get a team and you can engender that passion with them, it is an effective and efficient and wonderful way to work, a satisfying way to work. Well, and just before we wrap up, that's been absolutely wonderful. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have? Any last comments that you want to, would like to make or any nuggets that you'd uh, like to leave that we haven't talked about? Uh, a span of control is an interesting thing. How many people in your team? How many d- direct reports? Uh, the studies say seven plus or minus two. It is always so tempting to get more direct reports because that's an extension of I'll do it all myself is I'll get direct reports. That way I'm more, I've got more control over it. But for those direct reports, when they can't get enough of your time, boy, it's frustrating. So that whole broad span of control might make you feel satisfied that you've got all of the boards on the uh, the pieces on the board and able to move them. But for those pieces, they're being driven nuts because you don't have the bandwidth to be able to support them as an appropriately as a leader. And uh, I, I see it as a mistake that lots of leadership, lots of people in leadership do. So um, work on that span of control. And the structure actually matters less to me than the... Um, uh, than, than just the, the, the amount of time you've got to spend with people makes quite a makes quite a difference. That'd be one thing. And I guess the the final point, and I, I mentioned it before, but it's it really is the fundamental thing of leadership to me, is that you've got to remember that leadership is not about leading. Leadership is about removing barriers for your people to do their best work. Because that that's the thing that will make the difference um, for them and for your business. If, you're, if you are uh, um, snow plowing in front of your people so that they've got a clear run at what they're doing, you're going to be much more effective than if they have to work, work through the deep snow as well. Um, yeah. Wow, that's a great analogy, running the snow plow through the snow. That's uh, yep. fantastic. You, you, snow, you snow plow it for them so they don't have to. Yeah. That way they get a clean run. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you're doing two things, right? As a leader, you're setting the vision for the future so that they know where they're going and they and hopefully you've 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 sold it so that everyone's bought into that. And then come to, this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah come this yeah. way. You, we've got everyone on board. And yeah. then, well, how are we going to get there? Gee, it's a big snow, it's a whole lot of snow in front of us. So then you're running in front, clearing the snow so that they can get get the whole yeah. business and your team down to be down to that um that goal or that vision that you're uh, that you've created. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's brilliant. Vaughan, thank you so much. That's been absolutely outstanding. Love all the uh, the ideas and the thoughts and the inspiration and the nuggets that you've put in um, and, and given us with this. So uh, look forward to having another conversation at some point, but uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Campbell. Much appreciated. Okay. Cheers, mate. See you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you have a friend or a colleague who would benefit from this episode, please pass the word along. If you have a friend or a colleague who would not benefit but you haven't been in touch with them for a while, give them a call. iTunes reviews are great to get the word out and to help me create the show that's most useful for you. And if you're frustrated or having challenges or would like some help, guidance, assistance with your first leadership role, then check out integrationcatalyst.com in the link in the podcast notes below. Or pass this on to your boss to nudge them to get you the help you really need to cross the doing to managing chasm and get you powered up on your leadership and management journey. Oh, and if you want to make sure you don't miss an episode, hit subscribe. Until next time.